But my granddad was my first earliest inspiration. That's what involved us as grandchildren in, in cooking, because we always used to get involved in making the pastry, you know, cooking up the pea and ham. Their family was very much a cooking family. And for a man back in the sort of 80s to be cooking and cleaning like he did, the only thing my grandfather never used to do was the ironing. Hello and welcome to the What's For Dinner show. My name's Lynn and my aim, along with my guests, is to explore how our food experiences have influenced our lives as well as our waistlines. I'm also joined on the show by Michael O'Halloran for our regular feature, The Nugget of Knowledge, where we focus on a particular food topic. It could be a deep dive into a particular item of food, a trawl through the latest food news or a discussion about a food trend. Well, I don't, I don't know whether you've noticed me carrying a watermelon around with me these days. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> Where have you been hiding I keep it, it under my hat. <laughs> yeah. I'm delighted to be talking today to Michelle Beck, who successfully established a monthly independent street market in Taunton, making the town a go-to destination for artisan traders, as well as shoppers and foodies. So, Michelle, what inspired you to start this project? I've been organising events now for the last 10 years in Taunton. Um, Started off doing things like wedding shows and ladies' indulgence evenings, then moved on to a food festival. Um, And the natural progression was to organise a monthly market because Taunton is a market town and it didn't have, at the time, a weekend market. So I already had all the contacts and the enthusiasm and the passion to do it. Um, And we've been open now for two and a half years. You can tell by walking down the high street here in Taunton that they're sort of struggling to survive, really, as retail destinations. Why do you think that an independent market might be successful? I think people love helping local businesses. And these are very tiny micro businesses, Mm. you know, 70 of them all together. And you are supporting a network of 70 local independent traders who are all sourcing their ingredients locally you know, trying to put back into our own economy, really. Mm. Um, I think I get a little bit frustrated with people of Taunton saying, oh, there's nothing in Taunton because there is plenty in Taunton. You've got the amazing Bath Place, you've got Taunton's Independent Quarter, both of which have got 70 shops between them. Mm. And people always say, but there's no shops in Taunton. Yes, there are. They may not just be on the main high street anymore. The high street is changing. So when you're browsing the stalls before the crowds arrive, what is your go-to street food choice? To be fair, I'm quite like most of it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I love the Thai. Um, So last time I had Mexican, um, we had paella. I really do like to mix it up and and to try a bit of everything. Well, I suppose you can't show too much favouritism, can you, to the the traders? So you've got to try... Try a bit of eat. As you say, you know, you wander around and there's so many different options. It is quite hard to know which one you want to choose. And we have really tried to source people that you can't necessarily buy their, their products in Taunton itself. So if you were just going out for a meal, um, yeah, so like the Bayo buns and things like that, there's nowhere in Taunton that you can actually buy those. Um, so it makes it really, really unique. So how would you describe the food you ate at the dinner table growing up? We were very much meat and two veg. Um, Mum cooked every single night. It was always, you know, some sort of meat, two or three veg and and potatoes. So that's our staple for what we grew up with. As we progressed into our teens, as we all got fussier, as we all do, Mum started making things like vegetable lasagnas and spaghetti bolognese. But back in the 80s, that was still quite... Yeah, unusual. quite radical, yes. yes. Um, but my granddad was my first earliest inspiration. That's what involved us as grandchildren in, in cooking, because we always used to get involved in making the pastry, you know, cooking up the pea and ham. <laughs> Stews in particular was another big thing that we used to eat. Right, so it was when you went round to your grandparents' house that you got involved in the kitchen. More so, yeah, because grandparents have a lot more time than parents, Mm. as I think we all know. So yes, Grandad and my nan were both phenomenal cooks. Grandad was actually Keith Floyd's uncle. 
Oh, wow. So there was a, a <laughs> massive foodie connection there. And Keith Floyd used to live next door. So their family was very much a cooking family. And for a man back in the sort of 80s mm. to be cooking and cleaning like he did, the only thing my grandfather never used to do was the ironing. So where do you think he got that sort of inspiration from? I think from? his own parents. Mm. You know, I think the, the parents, my grandmother's parents and my granddad's parents were all cooks. And very, very good cooks, too. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the tradition hasn't carried on. Hasn't carried on. <laughs> so were they professional cooks? My nan was. Yeah. My nan used to work in restaurants and pubs, and they owned the Rose and Crown at Stokes St. Gregory for quite a few years oh, as well. Oh, okay. So that was more traditional pub grub. Um, but they could pretty much turn their hand to anything, and Grandad's curries were really well known. So being Keith Floyd's uncle then, that is quite interesting. <laughs> it, when, when I was 13, he just literally became, started becoming famous. Yeah. And he was quite a character, as you can imagine. <laughs> so as a 13-year-old, he was someone I thought was quite cool at the time. I yeah, think. yeah. So he was a character on screen as and, well as off oh, screen. Oh, absolutely. First time I ever met him, he took me on a pub crawl around with Willisgum. So yes, that was his old stomping ground and um, and yeah, he fell asleep on me. Yeah, <laughs> so. we had a bit of a taste for the red wine. Didn't oh, we? he certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he was a major inspiration for so many the sort of top chefs. Mel Gibson, White, Gordon Ramsay. Mm. You know, when he did die, the, the the comments that were coming out on the day. I remember watching Sky News quite closely, and you know, he was a massive inspiration, and he was what made cooking on television fun. Yes. Um, you know, you had Delia Smith and Fanny Craddocks, etc. Mm. But it was just quite standard. He made cooking fun. Well, that's right. And that whole sort of concept of cooking outside of a kitchen environment. Absolutely. Because he would sort of do stuff, you know, on a boat or on the beach. Or, and, and, and that with a splash that, of wine, obviously. Yeah, and with a splash <laughs> of wine. But that, that was very, very new, wasn't it? Whereas obviously now that's commonplace for Absolutely. For cooking yeah, Rick, I mean, Rick Stein, he did yeah. much better in terms yeah. of, <laughs> of his businesses. Well, I think it's all in the timing, isn't it? Keith Floyd was, you know, pioneering the TV. You know, it wasn't quite at the right time for the growth in restaurant Absolutely. dining. When you were helping out in the kitchen at home, what were some of the things that you enjoyed doing? I think making Cornish pasties is one of the things I remember mm. the most <laughs> because he would make the pastry from scratch and then it was putting the ingredients in and crimping it. And my mum was the cake maker. So we'd always have like a, you know, a syrup pudding or a jam roly poly or something like that. Yeah, yeah. For puddings as well. And fairy cakes are her forte. Oh, yeah, fairy cakes. <laughs> and, you know, her grandchildren now are brilliant at making fairy cakes because of my own mum. <laughs> I think suet puddings and things like that have kind of disappeared off the menu, haven't they? Were they were amazing. <laughs> so, um, I mean, my mum, her equivalent to the fairy cake, although I do remember making fairy cakes, was... Um, a sultana scone. Oh, oh, nice. So that yes. would be be what she would make. <laughs> yeah, mum would make scones and she was very much, you know, whip up a lemon meringue pie. Is Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, yes. Mm. I mean, and whenever, you know, I go to my parents' house for a roast dinner, this was roast lamb and lemon meringue pie. So it was, if it's my birthday or, you know, a special occasion, that's normally my special that's treat. That's the oh, signature yes. dish. <laughs> So do you find time for much baking nowadays? Not really. I'm not a massive baker. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, again, I'm a bit like the staples. I can make a good mm. spaghetti bolognese, a good lasagna, a good roast dinner. We all enjoy a roast dinner, but we've all got quite different tastes. My kids love pasta. I'm not a massive pasta fan. My okay. son doesn't like potatoes. <laughs> so when you're trying to find meals that all of us like... It's not that easy sometimes, yeah, yeah. And especially after 20 years of doing it. You kind of, you know, it just makes it a bit harder, I think. When you were a child then, was a roast dinner your favourite meal or did you sort of hanker for something different? I think I went through my vegetarian stage for mm. about a year, but I would still eat chicken and mushroom pies. I don't know. <laughs> what, from the chip shop? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I pretended I didn't really want to eat meat, but it really was, I think it was a fad at that stage. Mm. Do you remember sort of worrying about your body shape when you were a teenager? No, I was tiny. So I was mm. very lucky. I was... Yes, I was, it was as I got older that I'd started putting on weight. But no, I was a very lucky, thin teenager. Right, OK. And yeah, I could eat yeah. what I wanted and didn't put on an ounce until I got to about 19. And then I think it's when your hormones have all kicked in. Then I just, you know, then I had to watch what, what I ate. 
Coming up, Michelle admits to some very odd sandwich habits and recommends some of her favourite restaurants. Then later, Michael joins me for Nugget of Knowledge, where we discuss all things... No, hang on! You'll have to listen all the way through to find out what that one's about. If you're enjoying this episode, when you're done, why not check out last week's, where I'm talking to Maddie Dampier of at Madeline's Mills over on Instagram about her journey from baked bean-obsessed child to her current passion for colourful, healthy and innovative salads. It was kind of funny, and I bet if my mum was listening to the podcast, she'd be giggling right now, is that when I was younger, I was the fussiest eater. I would only eat baked beans <laughs> and maybe fish fingers if I was feeling exotic, but I, li- I would only eat baked beans, and the fact that I, if you have a look on Madeline's meals, there's so much vegetables, exotic ingredients, like so much colour. And the fact that that all came from a little girl that would only eat baked beans is quite something, really. So, I mean, we've talked about food at home. I'm just wondering, have you found that the footfall, you know, increases at Christmas for the for the markets? Are, are people out looking for if I'm Christmas honest, treats? It's been the hardest two Christmases because both times COVID has been around, ah. and we've only been operating for two and a half years. So we found that Christmas was really hard both years. Last month at the market, we had eight thousand visitors. Mm. It was huge. Yeah. Whereas at the Christmas markets, then. I'd say we're probably lucky if we had two and a half thousand, three thousand people. Mm. Oh well, that's interesting. Well, I mean, we have to have our fingers and toes crossed then that November, this year, and yes. December this year will be our work first out. really good Christmas with yeah, the market. Yeah. I'm really very much hoping so. We're hoping to grow. Um, so we've been on Castle Green now for two and a half years. We've now we've got permission now to use Hammett Street. Oh, okay. Um, so the, we're still toying with what we do with Hammett Street. Now we could make it an extension to the market. I'd quite like to see something like a vintage reclamation part mm. to the market or even a health and holistic side. You know, there's, I'm talking with something called Climate Taunton as well and they want to put on some sort of eco event too. And oh, okay. a combination of doing that with the market, mm. maybe in Hammett Street again, could work really, really well. Yeah. What would have been on the menu on Christmas Day in your house? For me, roast beef. Oh, okay. Always. So, yep, roast. I've not. I really don't like turkey. Don't like t- I've never liked turkey, <laughs> and it's always been. So my mum has always cooked a separate joint of roast beef for me. So everybody <laughs> else does have turkey apart from me, and I normally have roast beef. I, I don't mind a turkey curry afterwards, but turkey for me, no. So it's the roast beef, but roast you still beef. have the traditional vegetables, oh, the roast potatoes. Brussels sprouts is probably my favourite veg. Oh, really? I love Brussels sprouts. I love Brussels sprouts. I like making a Brussels sprouts gratin. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I, <laughs> and so I've been on keto quite a lot recently, and Brussels sprout gratin seems to be my go-to. Dude. So I've roast chicken, and then I'll do a Brussels sprout gratin, and it's so filling. So you're clearly a very busy person. How do you manage to sort of keep your diet healthy or is that always a challenge I think it's always a challenge Mm. Um, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination and I sort of you know once my jeans start getting too tight I normally go right I need to get back onto that keto diet again (laughs) so so what made you sort of opt for a sort of keto approach to because to your food. because I'm constantly hungry if I think I'm on a diet and mm. keto is one of the things that you could actually eat quite a lot of things but just eat the right things or okay. the right things to keto so I felt like I I wasn't constantly hungry as soon as I'm normally on a diet I crave a donut yeah so so what are the main kind of key principles of keto it's no carbs no carbs okay. so or low carbs mm. so no mm. potatoes no pasta no bread um, and you'd be so surprised at how much carbs fruits got, you know, mm. even veg. So you're only allowed to eat veg that grow up, grows above the ground. Oh, OK. Right. Um, so no carrots or parsnips mm. or anything like that. Um, and with fruit, you're allowed s- strawberries, raspberries, cherries and blueberries. OK, so it's not just sort of processed carbs then. It's Gosh, all no, carbs. No, it's so all, all the carbs. Really did help me sleep. You know, I certainly did feel better a month of not doing hardly any carbs. Mm. Pasta's not a big concern of mine, but potatoes and bread are the things that I miss mm. the most. But you can eat unlimited cheese, steak, right, chicken, okay. yep. eggs. Yeah. But the low carb certainly seems to... Seems to work for you. Yeah. 
chip sandwiches. I know, Come on. I know. But this was when I used to work <laughs> when I was 21. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think when I last had a chip sandwich. I know, it does sound quite nice now, doesn't it? Does it does rather, yeah, yeah. But I mean, they only really work with sort of Mother's Pride white slice, it, don't it, they? Same as a bacon sandwich. Yeah, Personally yeah. speaking, a bacon sandwich is wasted on really nice bread. Yeah. <laughs> I don't eat bacon sandwiches very often, but if you do, it's got to be the cheap white yeah, sliced cheap bread white, white bread absolutely or, or quite like a sort of a bat with bacon in no That's just for nice. me the cheap still yes. got that squidginess to it well you I had know, a posh fish finger sandwich the other day in this really lovely restaurant in Cornwall and it actually ruined it because it was too posh yeah and so do you like a bit of uh, ketchup or a bit of brown sauce I like ketchup I do but only with certain things I'm really odd um Shepherd's pie is one of my favourite things. What? Well, ketchup? Yeah, tomato ketchup. <laughs> on top or it's to the side? To the, the side, side to the side. To the side. But um, yeah, and I mean, I'd rarely eat ketchup with chips. But yeah, a sausage yeah. sandwich or a shepherd's pie, 100%. Yeah. Shepherd's pie. Now, where's that come from then? What? Oh, I love, I love cottage or shepherd's pie. Yeah. Where's, um, where, where does the tomato sauce accompaniment come just, from? I mean, that's my dad. Because he also, oh gosh, this is terrible to admit, we like a shepherd's pie sandwich. <laughs> So, so <laughs> only my dad and I and everybody goes yuck. Yeah, <laughs> but we love a shepherd's pie sandwich. So whenever we have shepherd's pie, my mum and dad's, it's always accompanied by bread. Okay, so we're not talking cold shepherd's pie the day no. after then. No, we're we're talking at the table. <laughs> I'm making a sandwich out of the shepherd's pie. <laughs> Maybe it's one of those things that's disgusting until you actually try it. I think it. so. It's a bit like having a crisp sandwich or something. It really is. Yeah. Until you try well, it, it's don't not knock them, it. it? <laughs> don't, don't knock it until you've tried it. I noticed that you have been to quite a lot of different places on your holidays. <laughs> Which of the places that you've been to on holiday would you say gave you the most inspiration in terms of food? Probably Portugal, I think. Mm. Portugal because of being on the boats and catching the fresh mackerel and that type of... I mean, I'm not going to deny that most of the holidays I've been on have been all-inclusive. So okay, that, you know, yeah, yeah. My, my loveliest thing was in France. I used to work at the Mount Somerset and I was their sales and marketing manager and I got sent on a four-day wine tasting course to Bordeaux. Very nice. So that was probably my... Mm. most amazing eating experience four days of wine from nine o'clock in the morning and just the most sublime food so french food is is inspirational but the portuguese i loved the fresh mackerel and the cuttlefish and things like that yeah yeah the seafood yes prawns and i can't say kenya was particularly inspirational i was very poorly there (laughs) (laughs) so um yeah i'm not gonna say that was in any way i think i lost weight on that holiday So you're not one of these people that goes on holiday to seek out little restaurants in the back Maybe and beyond. More here. Maybe okay, more here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did last week, in, well, two weeks ago in Cornwall. Um, I think it was called the Rocket Shed, and it was this little beautiful thirty-seater um, fish restaurant just outside of Boscastle, and it was stunning. And but the menu was it was just everything that was caught fresh that day. So it mm. changed daily. So we had scallops and oysters and monkfish and a sea bass. Um, and it was phenomenal. And I mean, my one of my favourite places to eat. I love, love my cuisine. Yeah, love, love my cuisine. And if I want to go somewhere for simple pub food, Ring of Bells. Yeah, that's it's good. Absolutely fantastic. Mm. So you'd rather eat out than cook at home? Yes, if I'm honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or have someone else cook at home for me. That would be quite nice too. Oh right, okay, yeah, that's always a good one. Isn't yes, it? <laughs> but rather than me having to cook and do the washing up, I'd much rather someone yeah, else yeah. do it. Now, I noticed you you wrote a few notes down for me and there was an interesting thing and it says cheese pie at Christmas with ham and all the trimmings. <laughs> Tell me more. Okay, it's really simple. My mum and my nan, they've always made for Christmas Day supper cheese and potato pie. So it's literally right, okay. mashed potatoes, cheese and a bit of onion. And it's just always been, it's like, mum, have you done the cheese? Of course I've done the cheese and onion pie. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. it's just been a tradition. And it's nothing... You know, elaborate, it's really simple, but oh my God, it's just really tasty. Yeah, an absolute tradition in yeah, your house. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So if you were, um, perhaps we should say, planning your wedding supper. One of my favourite places to go is the Ivy in Exeter. And my favourite dish there is the cheese souffle. So yeah, maybe, okay, souffle to start yep, with. Yep, yep. Monkfish with parma ham as a main. 
And I'm going to have to say creme brulee is pudding. Or maybe lemon meringue pie. Oh, lemon meringue. No, I would only have my mum's. Oh, meringue. okay. I, think, I, I don't think anybody else's could quite come up to my mum's standards, no, I don't it think. it would be a disappointment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> creme brulee is, yes, absolutely. But I never have enough room for pudding. And it sounds like you might, if it was a nice long, leisurely meal, have room for some cheese and crackers at the end. Um, yes, with a, if, with a few glasses of wine in between. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could sense you've got a bit of a cheese habit. <laughs> yeah, there's not many cheeses I don't like. I do love a baked camembert with lovely bread. And... Mm. The last question that I usually ask all my guests is, um, if you were an item of food, Ooh. what piece of food do you think you'd want to be? Cheese. A cheese. Probably a camembert. <laughs> Probably a, camembert. a, you know, yeah. ripe and, you know. Flowing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, let's go with a camembert. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Very tasty. Well, that's fantastic, Michelle. Thank you so much no, for, thank you um, for having me, Lynn. For, for joining me. We've had a good old natter, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Yep, and uh, good you. luck with the Taunton Market. And of course, you do them in Bridgewater and the Oval. Hopefully, we'll be bringing the Food Festival back as well. So, on Castle Green as well. Yeah. Um, but that's been on hold for the last couple of years. Because oh, well, it would be good to see that back as well. It would be fantastic. And that is holy food, obviously, as well. And some cookery demonstrations in the Castle Hotel. Oh, and that would be fun. So, yeah, str- mm-hmm. bringing something a bit more interactive back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people in- here in Taunton that. Um, appreciate the effort that you've been putting in over the past couple of years to to bring something new to the town great thanks a lot michelle thank you lynn now it's time for nugget of knowledge this is the part of the show where we deep dive into a food topic it could be the history of a food item a trending piece of food news or a current food trend or it could be a taste test or a recipe demo I'm joined by my co-host, Michael O'Halloran, partner in crime, so to speak. And for this episode, our topic is... I'm wondering, Michael, do we really need to drink as much water as we think we do? I hope so, because it's probably the one area of my life where I'm overperforming. Well, yes. The Eat Well Guide, okay, which is the government recommendations for eating and well and being healthy, says that we should drink six to eight cups or glasses of fluid a day. Okay. Note, it doesn't say of water, okay. it says of okay. fluid. So if you had eight glasses, that's eight 250 ml glasses, it means you're needing to have two litres of fluid a day. Now, most of us tend to think that we should be drinking six to eight cups of water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, But there's no scientific evidence behind that recommendation whatsoever, would you believe? It's really quite an arbitrary and random figure. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm glad that the Eat Well Guide says six to eight glasses of fluid. It's important to remember that um, about 20% of your fluid requirements come from food sources. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know? And obviously, the more high water foods you're eating, the higher that percentage would be. And also does include fluids from other drinks. So I'll have, for instance, tea, coffee. I might have a smoothie. I'll I'll obviously have some milk with my breakfast, maybe. And then I'll have multiple glasses of water. Mm. Probably overdoing it, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's not so much that you're overdoing it, because it's not going to do you much harm but it's i think understanding that it isn't a necessity i think what's um important is the whole idea that we have to constantly stay hydrated yeah, yeah. and that we have to actively drink more water or buy more water or buy more um of the sort of drinks that are on offer in the in the supermarket in order to stay hydrated yeah and constantly topping yourself up yeah like, whereas yeah. i think from what I have read, the reality is that your average person doing average sorts of things and behaving in a fairly normal way yeah. really shouldn't need to sort of think about it at all. Right, Just okay. the sort of natural day-to-day eating and drinking is sufficient. Right, okay. So there's a difference, you know, between thirst and dehydration. You know, so you can be thirsty and you have a drink and that's fine. That's exactly how the body right. communicates to you that you need to have a drink so of water. I suppose the issue becomes if you get thirsty and you don't have a drink. Yes, absolutely, yeah. You know, most of us don't get anywhere near to being dehydrated. Yeah, so how do I know if I'm dehydrated? Well, things like, you know, dizziness, lightheadedness, headache, tiredness, a very dr- dry mouth, 
or dry lips and eyes, you know, unusual urination. So if you're, you know, urinating a small amount infrequently, then yes, you may well be on the road to being dehydrated. You know, so thirst is the first symptom of hydration. So if you feel thirsty, have a drink, you know, but if you don't feel thirsty, you probably don't need yeah, to yeah, be yeah, worrying yeah, about yeah, it yeah. you know you, i'm sure you know what the other indicator of hydration is well one of the ones that i've I've always used as a litmus test really is your wee color yeah, yeah 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 if it's kind of a dark yellow you know that you've you, you need to hydrate yeah really. yeah you need to well you need a drink of water yeah or yeah you need yeah. more fluid shall we say yeah. yeah so if your if your wee is a sort of a pale lemonade yeah sort of color then you're pretty healthy and I've noticed if, you know, if I have drunk more, then your urine does change colour quite rapidly. Yeah. It does have a yeah. very immediate effect, really. But, of course, the paradox is that the more you drink, the more you need to wee. Talk to me about it. Yeah, so then you're losing water. Well, yeah, you're, you, and you know, and the more you drink, you're just topping up your your capacity to go to the loo, really. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I find it. I, give, I suppose I, it gives you a few minutes off work. Doesn't well, it, it does. Yeah, and I, I, minutes. I use it as a balanced approach to a fitness regime. Really. <laughs> yeah. Apart from the fact you don't have to even go upstairs to go to the loo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously there are um, certain groups of people who do need more water yeah. or yeah. more fluid than most of us. Fish. Eat. Yeah, fish. People. I'm talking people. Um, pregnant women, the elderly, are more at risk of dehydration. Right. Apparently, as you age, you're sort of the mechanisms in the body that flag up that you're thirsty can malfunction or oh, become right, okay. sort of less effective. So sometimes elderly people find it harder to recognise when they're dehydrated. Thirsty. Or, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, if you're ill and then you've got uh, you know diarrhoea and stuff like that, it can be dehydrating. And athletes who yeah. are sweating a lot, pretty obvious, they are actively losing more water through their sweat than any one of us does on a sort of fairly normal day or, or even doing fairly moderate yeah. amounts of exercise really so yeah so we've had these crazy high temperatures in, in the last week or so and periodically throughout this year but it's questionable i think whether you know if you're sat at home in the shade you know yeah. and not kind of out working in the hot weather enough to make you sweat excessively it's questionable how much extra hydration yeah, you actually yeah. need. Right, okay. Maybe I need to ease off. Maybe you do. You know, it's also a major marketing thing. B- Companies purchase that are, product. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that yeah, are selling yeah. um, drinks. Yeah. You know, it's, it's in their interest to make us believe that we need to be permanently hydrating ourselves. Yeah. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, you didn't worry about being hydrated. I mean, we didn't take bottles of water to school or, no, you know, no. have them in our bags or any of those things. Now, I'm not saying that what happened back then was yeah. necessarily the a right. good thing, yeah, yeah, but maybe yeah. the pendulum has swung too far in the other direction. Yeah. So she and about to take a glass, sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like, I suppose the point is that we, we we're not living in mortal danger all the time if we don't top up with water. So the other thing I wanted to kind of cover is, are some liquids more hydrating than others? Hmm. And I sort of thought of this talking to a friend of mine yesterday who was drinking coconut water. She said that coconut water was um, more hydrating than regular water. And I thought, oh, is it? Right, is it? Uh, It isn't more hydrating. The difference between coconut water and regular tap Uh water is that coconut water contains electrolytes such as sodium and potassium. Okay. So it is good um, for post yeah, exercise yeah. if recovery. you've been properly sweating yeah so yeah, if you've yeah, been yeah. sweating yeah. buckets running around the the athletics track or yeah, yeah. playing football or in the gym or wherever coconut you're in, water is going to be good yeah so it will give it as, as part of a post exercise recovery program then coconut water is an option right but if you're sat at home feeling a bit warm it's not really no it doesn't yeah. it's no different i mean there's nothing wrong with drinking yeah, it yeah, it yeah, tastes yeah. nice and lots yeah, of people yeah, might yeah. prefer it to tap water but you don't need to go out and buy coconut water you can just have some water from the tap yeah yeah absolutely yeah so yeah so that was one and the other one is about milk and whether milk is more hydrating right than other is it? other fluids well again a bit similar to coconut water i mean well milk has contains protein and carbohydrates so it does take longer for the body to absorb it so in that sense it 
has a greater hydrating effect on the body but more importantly is that it's a source of electrolytes sodium and potassium okay so again it's providing those minerals that are lost yeah, during yeah. strenuous exercise and excessive sweating there's nothing wrong with drinking those things but regular tap water in terms of hydration in a normal circumstance yeah. is perfectly adequate yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> oh and by the yeah. way alcohol it do doesn't count in the fluid count so you can't sort of right have your yeah. fluid intake i've had i've had seven pints yeah, yeah through through alcohol and it and it seemed to me a bit um unclear whether coffee could be included as well. right okay yeah, um, yeah and and the other element to this is about water rich foods you know so you may be feeling thirsty you know you may be drinking different products but ultimately if we eat more water rich foods then that's going to help our hydration as well well i don't uh, i don't know whether you've noticed me carrying a watermelon around with me these days <laughs> no i haven't <laughs> where have you been hiding i keep it, it under my hat <laughs> yeah well certainly melons of all sorts watermelons cantaloupe melons cucumbers yeah lettuce and they're great they taste so good yeah so all those salady things so that's great during summer period yeah. obviously yeah. in the winter it can be a bit trickier i think to get those things into your diet yeah. but um yeah so cucumber melons oranges lettuce courgettes tomatoes grapefruit uh, tomato again bell peppers yogurt cottage cheese yeah so all those things can also help to keep you hydrated you know without having to drink tons of water okay so it's um demonstrated that i don't need to be as i can be a little bit obsessive about some of these things you know and um, overdoing it on the water it's just not necessary no but you know if it makes you happy then it's fine <laughs> well i'm not sure it does actually <laughs> So my recommendation is keep it all in proportion yeah. and yeah. have a lot of water-rich foods in your diet. Drink a regular amount of water, maybe a glass with your meals, with each meal. You know, have a few couple of cups of tea and you'll be fine. So if I don't drink any water and I just replace it with juice, is that a good or a bad move? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a bad move. It, it would sustain you as far as hydration is concerned, but yeah. obviously a lot of juice is be getting a lot of sugar yeah yeah you know and certainly fizzy drinks you know they Not shouldn't great. be yeah, yeah no. so water water is your best bet yeah it is really and there's always sparkling water yeah true okay great okay, good thanks again michael well yeah let's uh, let's go and have a drink yeah yeah i think i need to go to the loo <laughs> thanks for listening before i go just a little reminder about my plea at the top of the show. If you enjoyed listening, please share an episode to your friends by clicking the share icon on Spotify or on Apple. And if you're listening on the website, you can share from there too. You could also share any of my social media posts if you follow the show on Instagram or Facebook. As a little incentive, if you do share by the 31st of August 2022, I will give you a personal shout out on a future episode of the What's For Dinner show to say thank you. Exciting, huh? Thanks in advance for helping me spread the word about my podcast. See you again soon.